Hi, Nina. Hi, London. I'm making both of you co-hosts. Just whoever wants to share can share your screen later. Yeah. Um, I can do it. Is that okay? Can you see that? Yes. Can you just click through it really quick? Just make sure it actually moves. All right. Looks good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Can you um stop sharing? Actually, I can make you stop sharing, I think. Uh, thank you. I'm going to, I'll share the my PowerPoint really quick because there's uh, something I'm going to go over before. Um, and then we'll, you guys will do your presentation, okay? Okay. So I won't be like immediately when we start, like usual. All right, I'm going to admit other students in. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Actually, can I have Nina share the presentation instead? Because I have a pop up that like will not go away. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Sorry, Nina. No, you're good. You're good. I think um, Nick is not here, but hopefully I have to go over some stuff um, first anyway, so it should have, hopefully he'll come in, trickle in. Um, but if he's not here, London and Nina, are you able to do it without him? You can just talk about your parts. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, welcome everyone. I know this is a very inopportune day. So thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, and let me share my screen. That's my email. All right, so we're in week five. Um, so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about, I'm gonna review visual analysis and to help you kind of understand the midterm draft a little bit better, because I noticed that some of us got really confused about things based on our exit quiz, so I'm going to review that. Then we'll listen to the In the News presentation, and then we'll talk about um, this week's topic, which is about tradition and Koreanness in music videos. So there are two parts of a visual analysis. Who can, you can type in the chat if you'd like. What are those two parts? A lot of us got this wrong. And I reviewed my video and I agree it's not really like highlighted in the video, but I do state state it. I do state that there's two parts and that these are the two parts. Yes. Yeah, so interpretation is one of the parts. What's the other part? Thank you, Aaron. This is the part. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Great. Description. Yeah. So description is first, typically, and then interpretation is second. So yeah, so description is putting into words what you see and then interpretation, making meaning out of what you see. So a lot of us said watching and interpretation. So watching is definitely like part of, um, watching you should think more of as 
preparing to do a visual analysis. When you're watching like and taking notes, you're really just getting everything together for you to start putting into words what you see and then make meaning out of what you see, okay? So watching is not really part of that. Um, although it is very important. It's definitely part of the process, but it's not part of the actual analysis, like the visual analysis part. So the past two weeks we've been focusing actually, and I should have stated this outright at the beginning, we've been focusing on description, particularly like preparing to describe. So doing the watching and taking notes and then putting that into words like paragraphs, that's a description, right? So we've done that with music and visuals. So that's the focus of your midterm draft is the description. And that's what you should be most worried about with, I mean, not worried about it, but what you should be focusing on while you're writing your midterm draft is just describing, putting into words what you see, and I should say what you hear with music as well. Um, and then starting this week and the rest, actually the rest of the um, mini semester, we're going to be focusing on interpretation. So now taking these music videos and what we see in them and then pulling meaning out of it. And so that's going to end up being the focus of your final paper. So after you submit the midterm draft, I'm going to give you feedback and everything. And then for your final, you're going to be focusing on developing a larger meaning to the music video. Um, and to do that, we're going to be focusing a lot on analyzing scholarly articles or peer-reviewed articles, which means that there's something someone has written, they've submitted it to a journal that typically has some kind of university backing, and then other scholars who similarly have like PhDs or they don't have to have a PhD. Actually, I've done peer reviewing, um, but they know what they know the field, they know the topic, generally speaking, really well. And they review that article and they say, yes, this can be published. Um, because, And we're going to be focusing on doing that, especially today, because for your final, you're going to have to reference or cite three scholarly, it says articles, but resources. And one of them has to not be from class. And that's for just for the interpretation part of it. So I'm going to, we're going to continually go over this over the next few weeks. Um, and, I'll, and I'll talk about it a little bit more in depth next week, particularly. But you need to keep that in mind while we're going through these next few weeks as well. Um, so for the midterm, just to review this, I went over this a little bit last week. So your midterm is due, your midterm draft of your music video analysis is due on Friday at 11.59 p.m. I know this is a really inopportune week. So if things come up, please just communicate with me. That's all I ask. Um, it's worth 100 points. Five points are from the week two submission when you told me what music video you were gonna analyze. Um, and then I gave you feedback on that. It needs to be about 750 words. And uh, you're going to have 15 points of the 100 is for your formats and slash style. So just following the formatting guides, which are really normal, such as be within two inch margins or one inch margins and Times New Roman, 12 point font, that kind of thing. And then style is just about you having put effort into actually writing it, not just, you know, run on sentence I'll have to run on sentence and it doesn't make sense. But the 750 words should be divided into three parts, basically. So you should have your introduction to the background of the group or the song, which should be about 200-ish words. So here, there's probably things that you're referring to and that you should be citing. Don't worry about it for this time. You can add it in later for the final because I next week I'll teach you how to do the citations. Um, but for this week, just get this like 200 words of background. Who is the group? Uh, what is the song? Why is this like, what is the significance of the song? Then you should do a description, a musical analysis, the description portion, which is about 200, should be about 250 words of you just describing the music. And so that's just taking that music portion of the music video analysis worksheet and then those notes and turning them into paragraphs. That's basically all it is. And then you're going to do the same thing with the uh, visual analysis. 
So we're not, it's not going to be APA style, Aaron. Don't worry about style. I'm going to explain the style. We're using Chicago style. I'm going to, you're going to learn how to do it. Just don't even worry. Don't worry about it for the midterm, but I'm going to teach you next week. But yeah, so keep that in mind. And then visual analysis, same thing with the description. Um, this should probably be a lot longer because there's a lot more elements to talk about. So I would say it's about 300 words. The other thing is you're just taking, so yeah, you're just taking your notes, putting them into paragraphs. The other thing is though, try and have at least one or you should have two ways that the music and the visuals connect. So that like audio visual synchronization, right? Um, or the choreography in the music or the intertext in the music. So the like references to the music, you should have two instances that you name and just kind of describe in which they're connected together. Um, that itself, just having those two connections is worth 20 points altogether. Okay, so do I have questions here? No. Does this make sense? Do we understand what we're doing for the midterm? Yay or nay? And I will take any questions that you have about this as well right now. Okay, so this is all in the um, assignment document under the module, but I just put it into a slide instead of in that big document about everything. All right, I'll give like 10 more seconds for questions and then we need to move on. Okay, so um, if you have questions, please email me. Um, do your best to get it in on time. Again, just communicate with me. I know it's hard this week. All right, so we are going to listen to the In the News presentation from Nick, Nina, and London. I think Nick is, did Nick come in? Yes, Nick came in. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing, and then Nina, you can share. Okay, um, I'm streaming from my phone, so like, sorry if it's weird. Nope. Sorry, hold on a second. Okay, I'm having problems right now. Hold on. See if you can just just share the PowerPoint, not your screen. Okay. Um, that way my face won't show up on everyone's screen twice. How do I just share like the PowerPoint? If you click share screen, there should be option on Zoom. There should be options and one of them will be the um it should be the app if you like your google chrome if that's what you're using yeah um it's saying screen photos icloud drive and then website site url but there's no like google uh slides or whatever um, click the site url okay And now it's trying to tell me to input like an actual. Uh, oh, like... okay. Well, just go back to what you were doing and maybe you can X my face off of it. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. Okay. Can you see your face now? I do not. Well, hold on. I don't know why it won't let me go back to the beginning. Um, I'm just, I'm just going to do it this way and kind of just like scroll down. Yeah, this looks fine. Okay. Um, okay, so our presentation is on K-pop and Korean nationalism slash tradition. Um, 
We're going to be covering Korean instruments, nationalism, traditionalism, and culture, and also touch base on fans, the ho- Korean holiday Chuseok, I don't know how to pronounce that, I'm sorry, and then also non-Korean idols. Um, London, if you want to start yeah. us off. Yeah, okay, so Korean instruments in K-pop, I have a couple of examples that I put. Um, BTS's idol um, has uh, pansori in it, which is uh, traditional, like, Korean drumming. And it's, like, a way of, like, st- storytelling. And kwenggari, which is, like, a brass gong, uh, as well as other um, instruments as well. They, uh, that song, it has, like, a very big, like, emphasis on like traditional Korean like cultural aspects and they like made a point to like specially include that as a like as a like a to like demonstrate their like pride in their culture um and in Vix's Shangri-La sorry give me one second the Gayaga which is this uh, instrument that I put a picture of right here, the long wooden one. It's like a traditional string instrument. You can hear it in, in like the composition of the song. You can hear it most prominently at the beginning of the song. And it also, that song also has like different elements of like Korean, like traditional Korean culture in it. And they also like they also like very intentionally made a point of like showcasing their cultural like aspects in the song as like a like as a on purpose as like a prominent part of it. Oh. All right. Um, in traditional Korean clothes in K-pop. These, in, I've been seeing it more recently than I have seen in the past. Um, and I think that is because of uh, K pop being becoming a like very big market, and you know, Kore- like K pop idols and people in the Korean music industry wanting to uh showcase the pride that they have in their culture uh, by using aspects of it in videos like these. So also, or so to also reference Idol and Shangri-La, uh, in both of them, they wear uh, traditional Korean clothing called hanbok. Um, and they also display other uh, traditional elements in the music video to like really make it this like unique sort of visual experience. And also I've seen a lot of uh modernized humble that look that like take piece pieces and aspects of it and turn it into like something new. So you can see this picture of Blackpink here on the side, they're wearing uh a version of like a modernized humble. And so you can mostly see it in like the shirt aspect. And so I think that's a really interesting like development that is like been had since uh that has just happened recently in like in the K pop industry. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Am I on? Am I good? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, so the article that I read for this week is called Cultural Nationalism in Korean Pop Culture, um, which was written by Hyun Mu Kyu and Jun Mu Kyu, who are experts in East Asian humanities from Seoul National University and from Yonsei University. Um, in this article, they talked about the context for modern K-pop, which included many of the things we had 
um, like previously talked about in class, such as like Korean trot and like Sotajian boys and like the Korean wave. Uh, however, I also brought up this like interesting idea that K-pop is not necessarily Korean music, like something stemming from trot or minyo, which is like traditional Korean folk music, but it's a deviation from this norm that began a new trend that like could and would be utilized to promote uh, Korean cultural industry, including like gaining a foothold in other countries through soft power, helping aid the country's uh, global marketability, um, and kind of trying to establish a new aspect of Korean national pride, which brings up an interesting point by the writers of the article, uh, that being of double-sidedness, which kind of like refers to how K-pop can act as like a sense of national pride, but can also be like denationalizing at the same time, where like uh, the ar the writers argued that because like the K-pop industry is highly focused on making a product for a globalized market that strays away from historic Korean music trends, the industry is now able to create an export that helps to strengthen the national power of Korea. And so this idea of strengthening the national power of Korea is something that's entwined with the concept of Koreanness as historical colonial rule brutally burdened the people of Korea who at the time lacked national power. Um, so for Koreans like uh, ensuring that K-pop remains a national export is something that demonstrates nationalism and patriotism. Uh, so in a sense uh, K-pop seems to become more non-Korean uh, like as it, sorry, as it becomes more non-Korean, it becomes Korean uh, <laughs> due to inciting a general rise in patriotism and nationalism. Um, so interestingly, these writers don't seem to view Koreanness in the same light that the text we read for this week does. For example, um, like Koreanness from the in-text class written by Saji seems to be more focused on like culmination implementation of traditional Korean culture into K-pop. Uh, rather than national state sentiment and social feeling that are echoed through the article that I read. Also, uh, Saji seemed a lot more optimistic with how he talked about how there's some aspect of Koreanness and K-pop um, in which replacing the more westernized elements of the industry within, like, with Korean, uh, like, iconography, scenery, lyrics, art, landscapes. There's, like, a like a plethora of stuff is seen as like a, a newer goal. And like a good example of this is like replacing build like background buildings or settings with a hanok, which is like the picture that I have on my slide here. Um, however, like he does also like echo some sentiment of denationalization when he talks about how um, like K-pop content should be hip to Koreans and provide non-Korean, uh, non-Koreans like elements of, familiarity that really don't mean much besides its clear westernness um however the writers in the article i read argued that there is a transcultural conflict that arises by trying to do this that being you sacrifice the global reach of k-pop to an extent by not having uh you know like slash replacing more western elements of the art form uh however like interestingly enough in my eyes, uh, both of these two things contribute to the overarching theme of Korean nationalism, which is having pride in your country or like being really proud to have Korean heritage. Okay. Um, so as most of you know, BTS is like one of the biggest K-pop boy groups out there. Um, they're they do certain live streams and fan meets to kind of just connect with their fans some of them are eat with Jin or in the soup you can see like the picture right there um they also have a show called uh run bts where they do like challenges and games and it's all a way to just like connect with their fans globally and within korea um they communicate in all kinds of different languages like you know, there's Korean, English, Japanese, and sometimes Chinese. There are certain idols out there who are in different groups um, 
who are Chinese, for example, there's Wei V, there's, I believe in Hypen. I could be wrong. I know that one of them is Japanese, but um, yeah. And that just all goes into bringing representation to Korea, like their quote unquote training for, you know, their career, which is in turn, I saw in an article that was referen not referencing, kind of relating it to uh, training for the Olympics because they're working hard and trying to create a name for them to also get um, recognized, like, this is who we are, and we're in Korea, like, just, uh, sorry, yeah, just rep bringing representation to their name and their culture, and having the fans kind of recognize that and understand it. Um, and then at the bottom, I wrote celebrating Chuseok, which is, if you don't know, it's a three-day festival celebrated in September, kind of just thanking their ancestors for food, basically. And in that picture right there, you'll see a bunch of banchan, which is side dishes. Those are like the main kind of, if you go to Korea, that's what you're going to see most and eat the most. Um, and then right here, I kind of wrote about um, how not there's non-members who are in K-pop groups, but despite them not being Korean, they still bring that Korean culture to that group. Uh, for example, there are basically all the members from Blackpink, except Jisoo, because she was born in Korea. Um, we have Lisa. She's from Thailand. She's like one of the biggest um ones in the group who are talked about currently because she has just so much going on for her uh she's a very successful dancer singer she's also the main rapper of the group um so when she came to korea and auditioned not necessarily for blackpink but just auditioned to be in the k-pop world in general she didn't know any korean at all and when she got a teacher she disciplined her by only speaking in korean during lessons like no english or thai whatsoever and that's how she learned um in this article it said that uh she was speaking to a interviewer and i can't remember what the interview was called or who it was with but in the interview she mentioned how it only took her a year to learn like basic korean so that was pretty awesome um, she can speak Thai, English, Korean, Japanese, and she's also currently learning Mandarin, which is awesome. And that ties into me talking about communicating in all languages for everyone around the world. Um, and then there's Rose or Rose. I don't know how to pronounce that one. Um, she was born in New Zealand. And then there was Jenny, who are, who basically grew up in New Zealand, and they both kind of have like that accent I, it kind of sounds Australian to me but um yeah I just all all of those foreigners in that group and any other group who aren't from Korea or, or who aren't Korean themselves they just they bring a lot of that Korean culture um to their group and then uh, I wrote about how Blackpink is one of the most known girl groups in the K-pop industry because of their choreography. If you know the song Do 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 or have seen the music video, you'll see that they do this finger gun uh, thing, choreo, or with their hands a lot. And yeah. Great. Thank you, all three of you, so much that hit like all the points that we're going to talk about today too. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. We can do like five minutes of questions. Um, just to go until like six 30, but I'll be the first to ask a question for all three of you. Um, so based on what you've read and some of the trends that are happening right now, do you think that the, the what's currently going on with the incorporation of Korean culture as like a platform um, in a lot of the K-pop media, do you think it will become stronger in the near future? Or do you think it's only a fad for right now and maybe it will just kind of fizzle out? Um, I don't think it's a fad. Um, I definitely think it wasn't as prominent in previous like idol generations. Um, but I think that like 
since it like has seen such a good reaction, I think that they'll continue to do it even more frequently. And like since like Korea is, is like very like prideful of like Korean culture and like Korean Korean traditional aspects, and so I don't think it'll, it's something that will go away. Yeah, I'm not sure either what to think. Nina or Nick, do you have anything to add? Well, just BTS and other like groups who are singing in English. Like I, I feel like kind of in the middle about it just because I feel like I know that they're trying to relate to other well, the more American um part of the fan base. But I feel like when they do that, like all their songs in English, like their Dynamite era, I feel like that kind of just loses the kind of culture a little bit. So Cheney asks, and you may not know about this song, but do you think that this interest in strategic cultural exporting of Koreanness became more popular after the success of BTS's Idol, or was it something that was bound to happen because of national pride? Um, I think it was something, it's something that would have probably happened anyway, but I do think the success of that song was something that really catapulted it into being a more common occurrence. Um... Yeah, because that song, uh, I mean, broke a lot of like a lot of musical records and, you know, went very viral. And yeah, but I do think if that song hadn't been put out, it would have happened regardless due to like due to national pride and, you know, love of Korean culture. Ali, I don't know what you mean. What are your thoughts on article of the denationalization? Can you reword that, please? Um, on Nick's article? Oh, on denationalizing, on denationalizing K-pop? Yeah, what are your thoughts on um that? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I think nationalizing K-pop. I think the way that I worded that might have been like really confusing to be honest, like the way that he he wrote it in the article was kind of confusing contextually. I think the gist of it is basically like you're you're westernizing the art form to an extent and by doing that you kind of like pull out aspects of Korean culture from the art itself but by being able to make it more globally recognizable and viewable you give it a larger audience and market um to be like catered to and have like some established um export from korea and that's like a big thing in korean this is having this um like inter like establishing international um, exports is like a big thing of pride because you're like sharing your culture and it's like we have this great culture look at it and like that provides that um, like um, aspect of the culture yeah there's definitely that assumption and Haley your question we're actually that's my that's my question um, to start our conversation off thank you so much Nick Nina and London um give them um some claps some virtual claps where's my virtual claps i don't know where mine are but um all right so let's talk about this a little bit more everyone together so we're in chapter three branding k-pop so we're going to be talking about the idea of brand like branding k-pop k-pop as like a product right um so this week we're talking about the k the the korean part of it what it makes it korean pop and Koreanness um, is particularly relevant to this to this question. And next week we're going to actually talk about products, which is a completely different thing. But um, so 
let's think back to the article and our own experiences. Um, what does Cedar Balseji say about the reasons for incorporating traditional Korean elements or symbols, ideas of Koreanness in music videos? It doesn't have to just be the the hip hop ones that she focuses on, but in general, what what are some of the reasons? So we watched a video. I'm going to be talk. I'll talk about her while you put in the chat your your ideas about this. So we listened to her talk about the Kim sisters all the way back in week one. Uh, Cedar Balseji, Professor Professor Cedar Balseji. So her her name is Professor Seji, Doctor Seji. Um, she's like the premier kind of K-pop studies person in in the world. Um, and she's actually an assistant professor in East Asian studies at Pusan National University. Um, so if you end up doing an exchange program, I actually suggest, I know students who've done their exchange, gone to Pusan National University and studied under her, um, which is a really great idea if that's what you're interested in. She actually talks, she writes more originally about traditional performance, particularly mask dance, um, taichum, if you've ever seen that with the really long sleeves um, and the masks. But she also is, uh, does a lot on just modern contemporary K-culture, like Korean music, particularly in performance. She's also, I say, chronically online. She Her tags on like Twitter and everything is the K-pop prof. Um, she's always posting on Twitter. Well, it's not Twitter anymore, is it? It's X. But she's always on there. Um, but she got her PhD in culture and performance from University of California, Los Angeles. She is from the United States. I don't know where she's from in the United States, but she is from the U.S. So what do you think? Why, why incorporate tradition, traditional Korean stuff? Okay, so national pride, yeah. So pride and quote unquote being Korean, right? It was one of the things. So pride, pride, definitely one of them. What else? All right, well, why don't we, we'll go back. We're going to dig into this article, distinguish themselves. Here we go. Yeah, something kind of be novel, right? Something unique, make it seem more interesting to people. Yeah. So let's keep this question in mind. and Let's dig back into this particular article. So we're going to be focusing on what you had to do with the blog today, which was identify the argument. Um so there's a lot of different parts to a scholarly article, but I think I've kind of boiled it down. The majority of what's important to understand about an article is in the introduction, actually. So first is the research topic. So that's just generally what the article is about, not what the author actually argues, okay? So some of us got that part, but we didn't get the further part, which is the argument itself. The next thing that is the research question. So that's what they're interested in answering in the article. That's again, that's not the that's not the argument itself. That's just what they're posing us to think about, to ponder, right? And then there's going to be research background. And the background is what is kind of discussed, what the art, author discusses is kind of the reason why they're interested in the topic and the question. What's kind of inspiring or influencing them? to dig into this question itself. And then we have the thesis statement. That's the argument. That's the statement of, in this article, I argue this. And that's the answer. That should be the answer that they propose to the question that they, that they are pondering. And it should be very obvious um, if you know how to look for it. It's not always, but in this article, it's pretty obvious. Then there's the method. The method is how the author is going to go about arguing that this is the answer. So there's going to be some kind of means that they use to to prove or to 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 go about that. 
Um, and then the evidence. So all of that is in the introduction, but then the evidence, which you also had to identify two examples of for the blog, that is actually in the body. So that's going to be specifically what the author provides as proof that the argument is. So using the method, they have figured this evidence out. Okay. So that's, these are the parts of a scholarly article. There's a lot of them, I know, but it's actually a little bit easier, I think, when you know how to look for it. And we're going to go through and identify these parts in the article together in order to answer that question, what Seiji is saying about tradition. So get out the PDF, make sure you have it available, because um, we're going to go through, I'm going to share my PDF with you, and we're going to try and together identify these different parts. So get that out. I'll give you like a little bit of time, maybe like 30 seconds here. You can please put a yes when you have a PDF, when you have your PDF available in the chat. If you're on your phone, it's gonna be a little bit difficult probably, but I'm gonna share mine here too. Thank you, thank you for the yeses. Uh, let me get mine out here. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Good. All right. So the first thing we want to look for is the research topic and the question. So we want to find where is the, where is it that Seiji just kind of generally tells us what this article is going to be about? And where is the question? What is the question that Seiji asks us to ponder with her through this article? So let me go back to it before I reveal it. Well, I guess I'm revealing it there. So not the abstract. The abstract summarizes the article. That's not what we want. And then she starts with this interesting thing called a vignette. This is kind of a aesthetic choice. Sometimes these scholarly articles, they do have a little bit of prose in them as well, which is, I like that. I'm, I'm a fan of that. Not everybody is. And this is just her kind of describing the music video, right? But now we're into introduction. So who thinks they can find where she says the general idea? You can copy it, copy it out of the PDF and post it into the chat. If you think you find there should be a specific statement. Yeah, so that is, yeah, exactly. So Cheney, you're on the right track. I think that is um, the topic. What's the uh, specific quote though from this article? Yeah, yeah. So copy and paste the quote because it's very, it's pretty obvious and it's very, I'll give you a hint, it's very early on. Who thinks they got it? Boom. Yes. Great. Not a, yeah. Sorry. Since it's a PDF, it's going to be kind of weird to po to, to paste it. Yeah. Here it is. I'm going to highlight it really quick. It's very, it's a pretty long one sentence, but let me read it quickly. Let me zoom in. Can you see this? In this article, I discuss conspicuous incorporation of Korean elements within the hip hop music video frame. And then she continues. Um, oh, sorry, Nada, you picked a different one. Now, this one is, that's a little further. That's a little further down. We're going to get to that one. We're going to get to that one. So does everyone see this one here? In this article, I discuss incorporation of Korean elements within the Korean hip hop music video frame. So Nada, this is important. Keep that in mind, but that's a little bit later. We're going to get back to that one, okay? Sorry, I misread what you put. So this is the general, problem. see how this happens immediately in the article? There's almost no, you know, like this should happen first. Like the author should tell you immediately what is they're going to be talking about generally in this article, okay? So do we see that? Do we see how this is the topic, the general topic? She doesn't tell us, I'm going to argue this. She doesn't say, I'm going to, she doesn't say I'm going to do like something really particular, but she just says, I'm going to discuss something. This, uh, this article is going to be talking about something. Do we see that? Okay. Good. All right. Question. Where's the research question then? Let's look for the question now. 
let me uh, get on this. So this is in this article I discuss. Oh, this is a different one. Oh my gosh. That is not the right question. This is not the right quote. Sorry. I'm going to delete this one. Um, okay. So ignore that. I'll fix that for the slides. That was for that should be for a different one. What's the um research question? Yes, exactly, London. Yeah, it is a question. It is actually posted posed as a question here. Yeah, see down here, this is at the bottom of the very first page. What then is the meaning behind incorporating items that can be specifically read as representing Korea within the video frame? Yeah, they made it easy for us. Not all the time are they going to make it that easy. Um, but yeah, in this case, the question is really easy, okay? Do you see how that's the question? Look for the question mark, obviously. All right, so the research background in this article. So there's three background points. After the question, Seiji gives us three background points of why this question is important. What are some of them? What do you think? After the question here on this next page. So, um, Yes, good, Nada. Yes, as a scholar of display of Korean heritage, I've I have noted a dramatic uptick in the frequency of inclusion of visual icons of tradition, which suggests that Korea is becoming rapidly more conspicuous as a character in these videos. Exactly. So that's her stating. Oh, so personally, she noticed this trend happening, right? So that's one reason that she became interested. So, Erin, this next this next sentence, that's more her kind of explaining the trend a little bit more. Um, not exactly like, that's not exactly, I mean, that's definitely part of the background of why she's interested, but that falls under the idea of like the trend that she noticed, right? Does that make sense? So this paragraph is about that. What about the next one? Yes, here we go. So this paragraph here. The government has become invested in popular culture as part of Korea's cultural diplomacy. It has created general funding instruments and initiatives to promote Korea. The most obvious and direct spending spur has been reserved for top Hallyu or Korean wave stars. Yes, exactly. So this is another background. So the Korean government has increasingly been interested in supporting Hallyu or Korean wave efforts. So K-culture, they've been increasingly interested in that. Good. What's the other one? Oh, yes, this one was earlier. The other one I found was a little bit earlier. Um... Yes, here we go. Good, Ali, keep that in mind. This one was, where did that go? Consumed by non-Korean people and therefore, where did I put that? Here it is. Sorry, this was one. This was the first one that I found. 
So what other people have written, this is what other people have written. Because Korean music is increasingly consumed as a visual and oral art form, often by international audiences who do not understand Korean, this music has become a visualized music often based on real labid Western elements. So, and visual analysis is essential for understanding it, right? So this is talking about how usually it's international audiences who are focused on and therefore they're Westernized. That's part of the background, but there's this trend going on, right? So there's kind of the juxtaposition between what people usually expect and this new trend. And that's part of the research background. And then that these new trends are being burgeoned by the government in some ways. Okay. Sorry. I don't know why I forgot about this one. Does this make sense? This is the research background here. Okay, so let's talk about this. The government, um, the government's investment in the Korean in in Korean in Hallyu in Korean wave. So cultural diplomacy. So this is refers to the use of culture or cultural products rather than force or policy to develop the relationships with other nation states. Right. So it's this idea that the government, instead of using so there's this idea of soft power. Has anyone heard this before? Soft power is like using things like the arts or like more abstract, like tourism and things like that to kind of develop relationships between countries. And that's opposed to hard power. Hard power is like military force or like specific policies as well um, to try and garner those particular relationships among countries, right? So in South Korea, this is very prominent because they have something called the Ministry of Culture, Sports, and Tourism. They have a particular sect of the federal government that is geared towards culture. In the U.S., we don't have that. And um, in a lot of European nation states, they do have something like this. Um, but because of that, in the U.S., we definitely have soft power, but it's a little bit more um, of a hands-off approach. We have things like National Endowment for the Arts, um, National Endowment for the Humanities, but they don't focus or they don't function on such a large scale as like South Korea. The federal government doesn't have a huge hand in it um, through those kinds of avenues, right? So for example, BTS was has gets selected as like a national or government representative. This is not the same as Hallyu, Nick. Um, Hallyu is just generally Korean culture spreading outside of Korea and particularly Korean popular culture. It is not originally because of the government, but the government now tries and capitalize off of it for its own kind of diplomatic and national gains. Does that make sense? So Hallyu has become something of a kind of cultural form of uh, form of cultural diplomacy but originally it's just these private companies that send the pop the pop culture out right but good question yeah um so for example bts gets selected as like ambassadors like they got selected to be the ambassadors for this is in seven years from now for the 2030 busan world expo which is also going to be held at hybe's uh head hybe's uh headquarters in um and so it's like they it's kind of a weird thing for an idol group to be selected to be like like national diplomatic ambassadors for something like this. Well, it's really it used to be weird, but now it's not. There's this other weird thing that I think it's really weird, at least. But did they even see these headlines about um, Blackpink? King Charles III honored the K-pop girl group Blackpink during South Korean president. Um, uh, the president's state visit recent this was just the, like this week king charles gave the four members honorary membership status in the order of the british empire because a few years ago at some world summit in edinburgh scotland um black pink like did a speech about how important environmental being environmentally friendly is and like things like that 
So he gave the membership, honorary membership into the British Empire. That is so, that is like, I don't know if this has ever happened before, particularly for not even just a Korean group, but any idol, popular cultural idol group before. But this is really unprecedented, honestly. Um, so, you know, you see things like this happening. But the point is that it kind of stands in for um, nation state diplomacy between the two, right? Good. All right, we kind of got to move along here. So I'm going to just kind of talk through this a little bit. Sorry, that's going to be boring. But so the thesis statement slash argument, Chebo Chebar conspiracy. It might be a Chebar conspiracy. Who knows, Nick? That's never off the table. Um, that is always, always possible. Okay, so the thesis statement. So many of you got this, some of you didn't. So the thesis statement is what they are telling you specifically, I'm going to argue this thing in this article. I'm going to argue this in this article. So you should look for words like I argue, I assert, I interpret, I believe, I think, etc. So some of us got that in a blog, some of us didn't. Um so this is the quote here. This is on this is on 251. There's actually two two parts that I found. I assert that Korean artists are now practicing a similar cultural reversioning as they replace elements that reflect American culture Korean hip hop artists and locality and a stereotyped image of hip hop culture with spaces and icons that speak to Korean identity. Did we see this? Do we see where this quote is? This is what she's going to assert. This is what she wants us to think. This is what she's going to argue, right? And then she has a secondary, a secondary bit, which is, I, I assert that these shallow engagement may indicate that Korea is being incorporated as a perhaps not yet fully realized character that operates alongside musical stars in their videos, right? So she's also going to tell us about how in incorporating these symbols and icons, it's not really something that's, uh, it's it's a little superficial, but what, what they're doing, okay? Does everyone see, does everyone understand that this is the thesis statement? This is what she's really trying to argue or get across, make you believe through this article. Do we see that? Okay, many of us got it, but some of us still didn't. And so notice this is in the introduction. This is like on the second page. It's not far down. You don't have to look very far for it. It's right there. It should be right there. Okay. In a well-written article, it should be right there. Good. Um, okay. So cultural reversioning. What do you think um, that is? This is kind of a weird concept. She didn't really explain this very thoroughly, I don't think. So this is the practice when a cultural group, so a group of people or artists particularly, take something from the past and they attempt to like reclaim it in the present while changing it to reflect something pres in the present as well, right? Yeah, it's kind of like modernizing your culture. You're kind of, I mean, that's what reversioning is, right? You're taking something and then you're like redoing it in a way. Um, but there's kind of a sense of reclamation with it that I think is important. So she talks about it. She's pulling from someone who talks about the way that in, U.S. American hip hop, black artists do this to like reconnect with ideas of Africa or African culture, right? Through the music um, and visuals particularly. So this is just one example that I could think of that I remember was pretty significant in the idea of reversioning Africa, um, which was Kendrick Lamar. This was I mean, many years ago now. I was in college um, at the Grammys, had this huge... Um, show where he had all these different like African elements and at one point um on the video the screen in the background there's like the continent of Africa and it says like it says Africa on it or something um and people were praising some people were like this is annoying of course you know and then if some people were like this is unapologetically African like that's so great right cool so it's not really African, it's not really like quote unquote authentically African, but it's kind of like something that speaks to Africanness that they reproduce through the music and the visuals in this case. And so Seji is talking about that's what these Korean hip hop artists are doing, something very similar to that. It's not authentically like really pre-modern or traditional Korean, but it's something similar to that that speaks more to like modern, their modern identities, right? 
So does this idea make sense? What's going on here? So method. So what is said you're going to do to prove this? A lot of us picked up on this too, right? So look for words like I investigate, I analyze, use, employ, consider, compare, things like this. So it's a very active verb um, of like actively taking something and doing, doing something with it. So she says this right with her, she says this right with her thesis statement. I investigate what symbols and icons are used to visually represent Korea. So that's her method here. She's going to uh, visually, she's going to look into what visually is representing Korea. And she kind of even takes it a step further and says she follows the themes in Benzino's video in comparison. She's also going to compare different music videos, these different music videos, to see what's going on with the symbols and icons that are representing Korea. Okay, so does the method make sense? Do we see how this is a statement of the method that she's using? Okay, good. Which is, what do, what rings? What do you notice about the method that she uses? Was this un was this idea unfamiliar to you? Looking for symbols and icons. When did we do that, or where have you seen that before? Video analysis, yes, music video analysis, exactly. That's what we've been doing. We've been practicing doing that part, right? Of just. We've just been practicing getting those symbols and icons together, not taking it the step further, which is what she does. But this is essentially, this article is a lot like something you should be thinking about kind of writing a very short, small version of for your paper, your, your interpretation part. Okay, so evidence throughout the article. So she presents these different case studies. So a case study is a specific object of analysis um, from which she draws the evidence. So what is her primary case study? What do you think? Where is she primarily drawing evidence from? She, we just saw it in the quote, actually. Benzino, yes, exactly. And then there's secondary case studies, right, too. So primary one is the music video. So think of the music video as the case study. That's what you're drawing your evidence from. So primary one is January, and then there's all the secondary ones. I won't make you list them. We're going to try and look at one here shortly. MC Mong, Jungin Tiger, Augusty, right? So then she has these other three that she compares to January. So then what are the three types of evidence that she pulls out of, out of these, these three music videos? A lot of you did a great job of picking up and pinpointing specific moments of evidence. There's three types that she uses. A lot of you talked about two of them, but this the, then there's a third one. I'll give you a hint. So, okay, so setting, good. So she says locality. Look at the headings. The locality setting is um, one of them, right? That's the first one. So that's the first visual is locality, where it's taking place, right? Where it, it seems to be in a place that looks like Korea. There's something that looks like Korea, good. So clothing, the fan, those are all part of the second one, which Aaron named for us here, iconography. So iconography is a, is a very loaded term, but it refers to just like symbols, um, symbols which are abstract, right? And then icons, which are more tangible, like that looks like the thing, right? Um, and so that can be props, objects, symbols that appear in the music video that signify Korea. So the painting, the clothing, the fan, right? All of that works together um, to be these kind of like standalone objects that symbolize or say Korea to you, right? And what's the third type of evidence? Some of us did talk about this, not as much as I, I, I kind of was surprised. Sonic engagement. Yeah. What does sonic engagement mean though? What does that mean? That's what I put here. Yeah. Sonic element, sonic engagement. So music, what were some examples of the evidence that she had? She had a, quite a few. So traditional instruments. Yeah, that was one of them. Exactly. I think that's a primary use. Yeah, traditional instruments um, or just kind of like elements of native Korean music, like rhythms and stuff like that can also be used. 
but definitely the instruments. Good. Okay, so do we get this? Do you see how these are like the types of evidence and then the specific evidence itself is like the details that she pulled out. That's how she decided to organize this. You can organize, you know, evidence all sorts of different ways depending on what you're talking about. So good, we have like 15 minutes here. So we're gonna practice trying to identify these different elements, but we're gonna use the music video that I know everybody loves. I like, honestly, I like the music video. Uh, the song is okay, but we're going to look at this. So let me send this in. Let's watch like two minutes of it, unfortunately. I know everyone really likes the song. Um, So watch the first two minutes and then we'll go through and we'll try and I have some stills from the music video and we'll see if we can pinpoint some of these visual elements or musical elements and visual elements. All right, maybe that was two minutes, maybe it was a little bit less, I'm not sure, I, I, I lost count. But let's come back here. So let's talk about this. So what um tradition, quote unquote, traditional Korean musical elements do you hear in the music video or even see? I think hearing, though mostly you will hear it. Pansori. Okay, uh, so the pansori refers to, so this is not, okay. So pansori is as a very specific kind of Korean music, which is like the picture that London showed us earlier, where there's a singer standing on a mat. That's what pan means. Pan means mat and sori means sound or song. Um, and there's a drummer accompanying accompany, accompanying that singer who's singing a, a narrative story. So in this case, this, what you hear, that kind of early part, right, which is what you're getting into, that like intro part, the first 20 seconds, that's not pansori, that's just like singing. That's just like um, what would be called gugak, which is national music or like traditional kinds of singing, right? So, so try not to call that pansori because that's not pansori. That's not pansori is very specific. Um, but yes, so the singing you hear that singing, ah oh, dechida, like singing like that. He's saying dechida, dechida, ta. Um, good. And then you heard the gong. Yes, there's a gong in there. Um, the jungle. I don't know if the I don't think the jungle is, is specifically in this one, but yes, the drums. Um, the drums are definitely, yes, here we go. None, the trumpet kind of sound, right? Yeah. You hear this, that like really like kind of sharp me, 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 me sound. It's actually like an, it's actually a reed instrument. So it's technically an oboe. Um, it's called tepyongso. Tepyongso. 
that has that high pitch sound. And then you'll hear it later in the song as well during the chorus. Good. What else did you notice? So into the song, what instruments or what sounds did you hear in the um, rest of the song? Not just the introduction. So yeah, I heard the gong, like on the downbeat, it starts with the gong, basically gong, like boom, like on every downbeat, like one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And then there's a zither sound. So a zither is like that string instrument that you pluck. Um, it's kind of like a harp. Uh, so the sound that's playing there is not necessarily like the Korean one or like the traditional one. It sounds more like a synth synthesizer sound to me, but it sounds kind of like a zither. Do you hear that? That's like do 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 do. That's kind of in the middle register. And then there's the guenguari, which is very hard to say. Um, that kind of starts eventually. That's this. This is not a gong. This is like a brass kind of uh symbol almost. And you take this mallet and hit it, and it's that kind of sharp metallic sound that you hear. Um, that kind of starts a little bit later. So there's all these different things going on right in the music. All right, what about visual elements? So look at let's look at this still here. What um quote unquote pre-modern Korean visual elements do you see in this? Think about the fashion particularly and the setting. So locality and then the iconography through the actual clothing. Hanok. So what makes you say that it's a hanok? the Hanok style. What makes you say it's a Korean village? What aspects of the architecture make you say that? What do you think? That's a little bit, yeah, right. So anyone can identify a Hanok, but not everyone can explain why that's a Hanok. Good, yes, the roof, the roof tiles. You see these roof tiles kind of come down like this. Um, those are called kiwa in Korean. There's kiwajip, which is the roof tile, and there's chogatjip, which is the straw house, straw roof. Um, and then paper walls. I think there is some paper, maybe there's some paper walls. I don't particularly see it here. Um, but yeah, the roofs and the walls, even these brick, these kind of brick wall here in the background, you see that? That's kind of signature of a Hanok style um, house as well. And yes, good, Haley. The lady in the back seems to be wearing some kind of humble. Yeah, exactly. She's wearing a kind of more pre-modern style outfit here, right? So the fashion, there's kind of like humble style clothing or particularly minbok. Minbok means everyday people's clothing. So notice how these outfits, they're more um, subdued. They're very simple, right? And that's kind of juxtaposed with what we typically think of as like the really flashy, beautiful, sparkly hanbok. Um, these are actually a lot more quote unquote authentic, very much, very similar to what somebody in the 19th century or late 19th century, early 20th century would have worn actually. Um, yeah, and then the setting. I mean, the setting itself is kind of very quote unquote pre-modern. It's like this market street, right? All right, what about in this still here? What are some, think about setting, think about, yeah, so fashion, hair, makeup. Yeah, the hair bun, absolutely. That's called a sangtu. And so in pre-modern Korea, men did not cut their hair. They kept their hair long and they would tie it up in a knot once they be quote unquote became men, exactly. And then they would wear that hat over it called a cut. Um, yeah, so the palace. So don't call the palace Hanok or a Korean house. It's its own thing. Like palace architecture is its own thing. Yeah, kings were not allowed to have scars. That's just uh, his Augusti Sugar thing or whatever. But yeah, the palace itself definitely kind of Chosun period. Um, it's a recreation of Chosun period house, of Chosun period palace, actually. Uh, yes, and then Aaron said what one one ren is what you mean, which is one ren, which is the Chinese word 
that's actually um these are guali or administrators here in the background right and, and you can tell because they have these patches on the back you can't you can't tell in this shot but they have these like white patches that are called badges yeah and then he has this dragon this is called a dragon rope shirt um traditionally or authentically it should be gold or red but he's wearing a black one just because I probably the, the aesthetic, right? So then this is a little bit of a different one here. It's a different shot. Look at the kind of props, the different little objects that are around the, the idols, the people, not exactly the idols themselves. They're not really wearing anything that can be quote unquote read as Korean, but there's other things going on. What do you notice? Jewelry box. Yeah, the jewelry box. What else can you see? The cabinet. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yes, mother. Of, oh, I'm very impressed. Allie, mother of pearl. Yes, the mother of pearl jewelry box and the cabinet. Yeah. I pinpointed a lot of different things in this scene here. So did anyone notice this? So this is a vase. This is a blue green vase called Celadon. This is supposed to mimic Korea period. This is 1200 to 1300. That's even earlier than Joseon. This is supposed to mimic that um, Korea period Celadon, which is type of ceramic, green, green, blue, green, glaze ceramics. The yellow dragon, that goes back to the symbol of the of the um um of, of the king here. It's actually on gold this time. Um, that's from the 1890s is when the golden on the yellow dragon on gold started being used. Actually, that's pretty modern. It's actually pretty modern. Um, the wall painting, this is kind of like a 19th century type of thing too. And in, in, um, elites houses, the mother of pearl lacquerware box. This is also a 19, this was earlier than 1900s, but the style itself is in the, this itself is more like reminiscent of like 1800, 1900s style. The cabinet, um, again, is this uh, Mother of Pearl Lacquer dresser. And then this little thing back here, this is a bronze incense burner. This is a gilt bronze incense burner. Um, this could be Korea or Joseon period. Um, but notice how none of these things, all of these things are kind of from different times. A lot of them are, are more like recent than you would think. They're not really as like old or ancient as you would think. The only ones that are kind of ancient would be like the incense burner or like the celadon vase. And those are like modern recreations of them, right? So notice they kind of hodgepodge all this together. So what do you think? This is our last minute here. This is the last slide too. So Seji leaves us with a question in the conclusion. She says, through the videos, the visual representation of Korean tradition is distilled down to a few icons that represent Koreanness. What Korea is being represented? Is it actually Korea or is it Korea as a new signifier for cool? So what do you think? Oh, okay. 715, you're welcome to go. Go ahead. Um, but keep this in mind, especially if you're someone who's uh, working on, so, some of you are doing um, music videos that have these kind of elements in it. So thank you all so much. You are dismissed. Sorry, I feel like I kind of rushed. I had, we had to rush through that, but. Have a lovely um, break. If you celebrate Thanksgiving, happy Thanksgiving. Um, it's Native American Heritage Day on Friday. So happy Native American Heritage Day if you're celebrating Native American Heritage Day. Um, good. Thank you.